Good morning. morning. First lesson is taken from Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 1 through 6. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people. It is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the lands where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their flock or fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. Here ends the first lesson. Psalm 23 will be read responsively. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in mourning. He revives my soul and guides me along right pathways for his name's sake. You spread a table before me in the presence of those who trouble me. You have anointed my head with oil, and my cup is running over. The second lesson is taken from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. Remember at Remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near to the, by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who are far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself at the cornerstone. In him, the the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. Here ends the second lesson. If you are able, please rise for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to a land They came to land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him 
and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into the villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in their marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. The Gospel of our Lord. Congregation may be seated. I'd like to invite the children down for a moment. Okay, um, we have a few visitors today, and I know you told me your name a minute ago, but you have to remind me. Haley. So we're going to say one, two, three, God loves Haley. Everyone ready? One, two, three, God loves Haley. And I know this is Everly, but is that right, Everly? <laughs> I must have forgotten to brush my teeth today or something. I don't know what it is, but... So we'll say for Everly, one, two, three. God loves Everly. Okay, well, um, boys and girls, I was wondering, what kinds of chores, what kind of work do you have to do around the house? Wow, that was quick. That was quick. So you don't have to do any or you won't do any? You won't do any. Okay, That's, there's a difference there. Do you have any chores that you have to do? Not really? Not a whole lot? What about the Wetzel girls? Shoes in the closet? <laughs> really, I'm, I'm kind of putting the parents on the spot here, I guess, you know, by uh, finding out what kind of chores they must do. Have a seat, Nathan. But um, the point, the reason I'm asking is because, uh, you know, Children, adults, we all have work we have to do. I mean, this is, this is the summer vacation, right? So when you're in school, you have a lot of homework to do, probably. Uh, maybe you play on sports teams. You have to go to practice. That's kind of work and stuff. But Nathan, you listening, buddy? <laughs> but my question is, what would happen if you had to work all the time? What if you had to work like 24 hours a day? What do you think? There's no right or wrong answer. Do you think you would feel good? How would you feel? Tired? Yeah. Probably angry, frustrated. Um, even mom and dad have to take a break sometimes, right? That's why we have the weekends. Well, that's sort of what Jesus was telling his disciples in this, this story today, too. That uh, it's important to work um, and to do the work that God has called us to do. But it's also important to rest sometimes, too. Um, so, you know, like when I was a kid, at the pool that I went to, we had to get out every 45 minutes for adult swim. I don't know why they don't do that here in Liverpool. Uh, and then all the adults would get in the pool when the kids would go sit for 15 minutes. But if you swim all day, then you can get too tired, right? Or not. Not sure. <laughs> Boy, all right. Not my day today. <laughs> Let's say a quick prayer together, boys and girls. Dear God, I thank you for these children. Um, we especially, Lord, again rejoice today uh, for our new sister in Christ, Lillian. Um, I pray, Lord, that you will help them to not only to continue working so hard around the house and in school, but that they might also learn to rest and enjoy the peaceful moments of life as well. We pray all these things in your holy name. Amen. Okay, thanks, boys and girls. Boy and girls. <laughs> when I was about 10, my mom tried to teach me to play tennis. She still plays tennis to this day, in fact. Um, but back then, I think she was looking for someone to play with casually on a regular basis, just to kind of 
hit the ball back and forth, you know. So one summer evening, we went to one of the neighborhood tennis courts, but the lesson did not go well. Uh, every time I hit the ball, it either hit the net or went way out of bounds. And as this hot evening wore on, I kept getting more and more frustrated and angry. And eventually, I think I threw the tennis racket up in the air, and I said, I hate tennis, and I'm never playing again. And I'm sad to say that I was true to my word. <laughs> uh, never again did I endeavor to learn that noble sport. But despite never playing again, I have enjoyed watching tennis over the years. And just a few weeks ago, something very interesting happened at the French Open involving a player named Naomi Osaka. Perhaps you heard this in the news. But if you haven't heard of her, Naomi Osaka was born in Japan. Uh, her mother is Japanese, and her father is from Haiti. But at age three, she moved, she moved to Long Island, and so she grew up in the United States. But anyway, Naomi Osaka entered the French Open in June as the number two seed, like worldwide, ranked. But, uh, and this is shortly after winning her fourth major tournament. She won at the Australian Open this February. So she's kind of on top of the world going into this tournament. But shortly before the tournament began, she announced that she would not be doing the mandatory press conferences that all the players were expected to do. After winning her first, her first match, um, she did not have a press conference, and she was fined $15,000 and threatened with more fines and even to be ejected from the tournament. And so the following day, she announced that she was withdrawing from the French Open, citing mental health issues. Many tennis players, as well as athletes from other pro sports, expressed their support for Osaka, but others were more critical. In June, her agent announced that she would not participate in the upcoming Wimbledon Championship, but that she would take part in the Olympics, which I think are just next week, in Tokyo. The current issue of Time Magazine has a picture of Naomi Osaka on the cover and features a short article she wrote titled, It's Okay to Not Be Okay, and It's Okay to Talk About It. She explains that the reason she skipped the press conferences was to exercise self-care and to protect her own mental health because they were causing her so much anxiety. She talks about her emotional struggles, the pressure to maintain a perfect image, and the effects of living under constant scrutiny. All of these things had taken a toll on her and she really just needed to take a break and regain some sort of balance in her life. I think the reason that this incident with Naomi Osaka made headlines was that most people could relate. It's not just professional athletes and celebrities who face challenges from constant stress, career burnout, and mental health. I recently spoke with a woman about my age who in the middle of pandemic had to start taking care of some relatives who were facing medical problems and had lost the ability to drive. Pandemic, of course, was stressful for everyone, but all of a sudden, she found herself juggling the needs of her job, her children, and her relatives. Now, thankfully, she's fine. The relatives are much better and no longer requiring assistance, but things can change fast, right? Just in the drop of a hat. Probably at some point or another, you have had the experience of just having too many irons in the fire, and I'll bet at some point, you have felt spread thin between the many competing demands of life. Some years ago, I saw a video of a man named Eric Bren doing the plate spinning routine. If you've seen that, remember, this is like on the Ed Sullivan show. And uh, he started getting this glass bowl on a stick, and then he got another one, another glass bowl on the other side of the table, and he started spinning all these bowls, and before long, he has five bowls spinning in the air and eight dinner plates spinning on this table, and he's running around wildly back and forth to make sure they all keep spinning and preventing any of them from falling to the ground and shattering. And I used to think that was really funny, but now it just kind of stresses me out watching that thing, thinking about how much that feels like everyday life, <laughs> right? Running from here to there, uh, so many things going on at once, always afraid something will drop, and all the while wondering, how much longer can I do this? <laughs> In his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, 
Um, Stephen Covey talks about the need to sharpen one's axe. And he tells this little story about sharpening an axe. And I'm kind of paraphrasing the story here, but he said, once upon a time, there was a very strong young woodcutter that was hired to clear out an overgrown forest. The pay was excellent, the working conditions were good, and so for these reasons, the woodcutter was determined to do his best. His boss gave him a nice sharp axe and showed him the area where he would work. So on the first day, he felled 18 trees. Congratulations, the boss said. Keep up the great work. Encouraged by the positive words, the woodcutter worked even harder the next day, but he could only cut down 15 trees. On the third day, he tried even harder, but he could only manage 10 trees. As the week dragged on, he finished each day with fewer and fewer trees. I must be distracted, the woodcutter thought to himself, or maybe I'm forgetting the fundamentals. He went to the boss and apologized, saying that he could not understand what was going on, but promising to work even harder next week. And the boss asks him, when was the last time you sharpened your axe? And the woodcutter says, sharpen my axe. I don't have time for that. I'm too busy cutting trees. Life wears us down. We need time to rest and reflect. A few weeks ago, during vacation Bible school, we told our, story, uh, we told our children the story of Moses and the exodus from Egypt. For 400 years, the Israelites were slaves, working day in and day out. And while the Bible doesn't give us the exact specifications, the biblical scholars are pretty sure they didn't have weekends, paid vacation, or sick days during those 400 years. But shortly after God used Moses to lead the Israelites through the Red Sea, God gives them the Ten Commandments. And I know, I know Chloe's here. I see Lawrence here, some confirmation students. You guys remember commandment number three, Lawrence and Chloe? I think I heard, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, right? Oh, there's Charles. He, he had it over there. Yeah, there he is. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God, and you shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. The Lord commanded, not encouraged, not recommended, but commanded that one day a week they should not do any work. Now, do you think God intended that as a punishment or as a blessing. <laughs> In this morning's gospel story, the disciples have just returned from the mission on which Jesus sent them at the beginning of chapter six. He'd given them authority over the unclean spirits. They went about proclaiming that all should repent, casting out demons and anointing with oil and curing all those who were sick. It sounds like very demanding work, considering they had only the clothes on their back I would imagine that emotionally, physically, and spiritually, they were worn out, walking around from village to village um, with nothing even in their pockets. No wonder they needed a break. They had no leisure even to eat, Mark tells us. And so Jesus says, come away. Come away to a deserted place and rest a while. This passage reminds me that Jesus is our good shepherd who wants to make us lie down in green pastures and lead us beside still waters, as King David wrote so beautifully in the 23rd Psalm. Too often, those words come to our minds only after the death of a loved one. But Jesus wants to shepherd us every day, from the day we are born, to the day of our baptism, to the last day of our lives on this earth, God seeks to lovingly provide us with everything we need, including rest and renewal. And we're all guilty of it from time to time. I myself am guilty. I've broken the Sabbath and worked on the Sabbath on numerous times. We're all guilty of it from time to time. 
And please don't get the impression that I'm criticizing Naomi or Osaka or the woman I mentioned who suddenly found herself taking care of multiple generations. I'm not criticizing them for not taking better care of themselves. That's not my intention. In fact, I think Naomi Osaka should be praised for making herself vulnerable, for opening herself up to criticism and speaking honestly about the struggles she was going through. In the Time Magazine article, she said, pro athletes are humans too. And what a great reminder that was. Unless anyone here is a robot or from another planet, then we're all human, right? And that's okay. Nothing wrong with that. Jesus loves you the way you are, and thankfully he loves you too much to leave you that way. Like the guy on the Ed Sullivan Show, we can only spin so many plates at once. I think the Guinness Book of World Records for spinning the most plates at once is 108. <laughs> Pretty good, right? 108 plates spinning at once. But even that guy couldn't do 109. He could only do so much. He was only human. How many plates do you have in the air right now? And more importantly, how many plates do you actually really need to be spinning right now? Jesus is inviting you to put the plates down just for a moment and to rest in his grace and in his peace. I wish you all a joyous Sabbath day. Amen.